Kimmer was advanced in that it also had, not only did it manage these uh, um, modules, task modules, but there were, um, the, just like, uh, it's similar to Simulink, it had um, a program, a visual programming interface where you could drag and drop um, software modules that uh, in some cases did auto connection. Um, uh, then the apps represented uh, these uh, primitives, if you will, that could be uh, brought together in what was a two-layer uh, visual programming interface. Um, and this is an example of programming uh, in a graphical format for state transition diagrams. Uh, but there was also um, what was called Anika, a visual programming environment um, for less, let's say, lower skilled. Um, so the this is what we call the control engineer's interface. So you had to know what you're doing at a, at a detailed level in terms of what you connected and how you connected them, even though it did do some protection of interconnecting modules, and some of them were automatically connected based on naming schemes. Um, but you had to kind of know what you're doing to build tasks at this level, much like Simulink, it required some training. Anika was a higher level that did things by these puzzle pieces. And so um, um, it was very structured in what it would allow. You have your, your start, uh, stop, you know, your start signal at the beginning and an end signal. And then you could put in things that were um, the puzzle pieces and coloring and shape of the puzzle pieces determined what you could stick together. And so this is an example of a module. So this is a, a task module which moved a robot um, in joint space. And so it caused motion in joint space. And here's the name of a joint space trajectory called home. And so it would move to home. It then moved to position one and then in joint space. And then you can see this different interface was a Cartesian. It's a straight line uh, con a controller. So this was joint interpolated, this was linear interpolation, and um, it took special inputs. Um, and so the, it could go move to home, move to a known position, approach, and then it would to point two, and then it would transition into a um, joystick in, in this particular operation, then allowed for teleoperation of the robot and then completed once that was done. Um, so this could be assembled from a pallet of these puzzle pieces. Um, and then we even went to, uh, um, again, this is uh, uh, older work and Gazebo is an example of, of doing many of these capabilities. There have been some visual environments put together under Ross commands. Um, this was uh, kind of an e early form of a gazebo that could use and make use of some of these graphical stand state transition diagrams that um, you incorporated not only um, kinematic motion but also uh, force programming. Okay, there are other tools again like this. Of course, there's MATLAB Singulink, Real Time Innovations had uh, this thing called Control Shell, um, which is uh, similar uh, use at the uh, control kind of the control engineers uh, framework. Um, and also, again, there's all kinds of data recording. These things are available in uh, numerous types of commercial products, including things like LabVIEW and, uh, and MATLAB. Um, I want to talk a little bit about optimization. Um, and um, the, you know, what are the ways to optimizing programs? Um, one thing is, you know, you generally want to compute tasks at the slowest um, cycle rate possible. Um, that are within your performance bounds. What we've seen, or, or, or what we know, I should say, from um, control systems classes is that, um, you know, a control task um, is executed at uh, slowest, uh, I'm sorry, um, when a control algorithm, generally as you slow down the sample rate, you, you reduce the um, quality or the, the control performance of the uh, task um, and uh, and so you have to do it within acceptable bounds but oh uh, generally uh, the opposite can be true yep you get better and better um, performance can increase 
um, to get better and better as you go faster and faster. But um, eventually you get to the point where um, of diminishing uh, returns, where you start going faster and faster and faster. Um, remember, we've talked about operating system overhead before. Um, and eventually you're going to max out. The faster and faster you run, your, your CPU time is going to be dominated by the rescheduling tasks that has to happen. Remember, there is computation involved in scheduling. Um, and again, the example we showed is, yeah, in the helicopter um, that um, the, uh, we want to do this as slow as possible, you know, but sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, a task like um, the at helicopter attitude control. You know, that's usually a, a complex adaptive controller, some sort of nonlinear controller. Um, so we want to run that slower because it's uh, very compute intensive. Another thing that is uh, common in uh, microprocessors is to use scaled arithmetic. Um, and uh, in other words, integer fixed point instead of floating point, because floating point is slow. It just takes a lot of time, even when you have a coprocessor. And many of our embedded microprocessors don't have math coprocessors in hardware. They use software emulation of floating point. Um, and our, a lot of our embedded systems, it's always, it comes down to quantized data because you're taking I.O. and it has finite precision anyway. Um, and so um, using fixed point calculations as much as possible instead of floating point calculations is still a common way of um, optimization, of uh, systems optimization. Um, and things like lookup tables for complex functions. You know, memory um, today is generally much cheaper um, and more efficient. There may only be one transistor in a, a bit of memory compared to the number of transistors and gates it takes to implement a floating point calculation in hardware. Um, and so you can use lookup tables um, and in even uh, um, short-term interpolation for things like sine, cosine, tangent, stuff like that. Um, and again, there are a whole bunch of things you can do for application-dependent mappings, for nonlinear functions um, that could be like sigmoidal for neural networks, um, or a number of other functions that might be difficult or um, numerically intensive to compute when yeah, memory can just serve if you look up and then provide a way to scale the function and, and, uh, in both potentially both in time and in, in amplitude. So again, those are ways to make real-time systems, and they're just as applicable to real-time systems, and sometimes more so because we can get higher speed performance with a lookup table than actually uh, computing a uh, function. Um, there are some other things that go on in code optimization. Most of our compilers do this for us. Things like eliminating ar ar arithmetic identities, um, you know, reduction in strength of the type of uh, you know using. If you want to multiply by two, it's much easier to rotate. Um, an integer than it is to actually do a multiplication. Um, common sum expression elimination, use of registers and caches. We've talked about caches and their impact. Um, they, they certainly have beneficial impacts on computer performance. Got to keep in mind, um, they can increase jitter. Um, and then uh, inline coding and macros. Now again, most high performance compilers, certainly the GNU compiler, which is used in, in most products, um, for compilation is, you know, are very efficient. They have uh, various levels of uh, optimization built in. And this is something that's really critical. When you write real-time code, um, you have to make sure that you're not optimized out. Okay, and so that's why you use a lot of static, particularly when there's shared variables, when other functions could be updating a shared variable, you need to let the compiler know that in fact it is uh, it could update basically on its own. Okay, and so that is um, what we have today for uh, um, synchronization and communication, and uh, I thank you for uh, paying attention.